Jesus said, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Listen, that verse in Matthew 24 alone should be a loud wake-up call for us because in the days of Noah, the world had gone totally and completely wicked. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and this is From His Heart. We're in a series this month called The Days of Noah. They were days that grieved the heart of God. Now, I believe that those days are upon us again. And the question is this, is it too late to turn back? We'll find out today. So open your Bible to Genesis chapter 6, and let's discover what happens when a world goes wicked. I hold in my hands a relic from the not too distant past. Who knows what this is? Huh? You guys know what this is? Have you ever seen one of these? Just in museums, right? This is a, a vinyl record. Now, this is all we had growing up. We had vinyl records. This is from Debbie's uh, collection, The Best of Sonny and Cher. Uh, it's pretty good. It's got the beat goes on and I got you, babe. Uh, but we had records and uh, that's just what you had and you would go to the record store and you'd see what kind of records they had and and you know you had your turntable and boy when I got out of college I spent money to get my record player and all the stuff you know because you had to have that but when I was a kid growing up I remember my oldest brother he's nine years older than I was he would tell me now Jeff I just got a new George Harrison record don't mess with it because you're liable to scratch it you know, they're very, you had to be really careful with the records because they would scratch easily. But that's what happened to a record. It would get scratched and then it would just keep repeating itself. That's what history is like. History is like a broken phonograph record. It just keeps repeating itself. Jesus said, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Just as it was back in the days of Noah when Jesus was talking about the future, he said, hey, you know what it's going to be like, the future guys in Matthew 24? It's going to be just like it was back in the days of Noah. History is just going to repeat itself. We're starting a new series today called The Days of Noah, and we're going to look at what the Bible says about these important days Days that were past and days that are coming because Jesus said that they're going to be the days that are coming are going to be just like the days of Noah that have passed. Now, Noah has been in the news a lot in the last several months because Hollywood did a big, huge uh, movie about Noah. They spent $120 million producing Noah and then probably another 50, 70, maybe $80 million uh, advertising the movie Noah with Russell Crowe and whoever else is in it. And I was all excited about Noah until I found out that the director boasted that this was going to be the most unbiblical of biblical epics. And I said, well, I'm not going to that. I don't want to give that guy a thin dime if he's going to produce a biblical epic that is the most unbiblical, and he's proud of it. Now, uh, it's okay if you saw it, but, uh, but I didn't want to see it because I had read about it, and I read how uh, it, it had nothing to do with, uh, it, you know, maybe they had a flood in there, right? So it had, a, and it had a big boat. I mean, it had something to do with Noah, but it didn't go off the text at all. It's kind of like if you saw the movie Noah it w and you're wanting to learn about what was it like during the days of Noah, that would be like going to see, if you wanted to find out about Abraham Lincoln, so you went to see Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. You know, and it's like, I don't think he was doing that, right? But it just goes off in this weird direction. So in this series, we're going to look and see what does the Bible say about the days of Noah. Obviously, 
we know from Scripture that the days of Noah were days of judgment, and God destroyed the world with a flood. Forty days and forty nights of intense rain that flooded everything and blotted out man and beast and anything that breathed, creeping things and birds, anything that breathed from the earth was blotted out during the days of Noah. They were days of judgment. And I believe that these are important days to study because as it was, so shall it be. And as the people of that day were coming up on judgment and they didn't even realize it, I think the people of our day were coming up on judgment and many people don't even realize it. It was some decades ago that Ruth Bell Graham, Billy Graham's wife who's in heaven now, she died in 2007. But it was in the late 60s, early 70s when she told Billy these words. If God doesn't judge America, I think he's going to have to, ni- to issue an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. That was decades ago when she said that. How much closer are we to judgment? So this study is going to be a word of warning. It's going to be a word of wake up because so many of us have fallen asleep in compromise and mediocrity in our Christian lives. And it's an opportunity for us to get right with God while there's still time. So today we want to look at this subject, a world gone wicked. Hey, what do we learn from Scripture about the days of Noah? If you have your Bible, please turn to Genesis chapter 6. You're going to get so much more out of today if you will follow along in your Bible. There's a Bible in the, in the pew in front of you if you don't have a Bible with you. The Scriptures will be on the screens, but we're going to go refer back to them several times, so it would just be helpful if you had an open Bible in your lap. Genesis chapter 6. I'll begin reading in verse 1. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. What do we learn from Scripture about the days of Noah? Three discoveries I want you to notice with me. Discovery number one, the devil is hard at work. Hard at work during the days of Noah. Now, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. It's the book of origins. And when we read in Genesis, we read about the creation story. We read how God spoke and it came into being. The book of Genesis doesn't tell us anything about evolution. You know why? Because evolution doesn't exist. That's why. Okay? Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons it doesn't talk about that. Uh, You have evolution within the species, obviously. You don't have evolution outside of the species. Uh, A a duck doesn't become a grasshopper or vice versa. You don't have things like that. Uh, God set it up, and, and he spoke it into existence just like he said. Six days of creation. Well, we have that in Genesis chapter 1. One, we have everything is being created. And in Genesis chapter 2, we zero in on day 6 of creation, and God is telling us about creating man. Adam was created first, and then Eve was created to be Adam's helper, to be the one suitable to him, to be the one that, that could come alongside him, help him, and be fruitful and multiply with him. 
And we read about that. And, you know, at the end of Genesis chapter 1, where God gives the broad picture of how everything is going, he said, and it was very good. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. Now, the women know that it, it was only good until the woman came along, and then it became very good. And that's, that's really true. A woman just makes life just very good. My life was good, and then I met Debbie, and it became very good. And so that's how it worked. And then it, everything's going good. Chapter 2, it's going good, and that's when God brings Eve to Adam, and they get married. And for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. It's a wonderful experience. They're in the Garden of Eden. They're there together. They're married. They're experiencing the love of God. There is no shame. There is nothing to cover up. Life is wonderful. But then Genesis chapter 3, we are introduced to the serpent. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And in chapter 3, we have the fall of man. And... The serpent deceives Eve, and Eve eats of the forbidden fruit, and she gives some to Adam, and Adam eats of the forbidden fruit, and their eyes were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and then when God comes down in the cool of the day to walk with them, what are they doing? They're hiding from the presence of God. They were, in chapter 2, naked and not ashamed, and now they're covered up, and they're afraid, and they're ashamed, and they're hiding, and God pronounces judgment. He finds out... uh, not finds out for information. God knows everything, but he asks them, did you eat of the tree I told you not to eat of? And so then they tell him what's going on, and the serpent deceived me, Eve tells God, and then God pronounces judgment upon the serpent. And in God's pronouncement of judgment upon the serpent, something very interesting, God promises a Savior. After the fall, God promises a Savior. Genesis Chapter 3, verse 15, in the Good News Bible, the Lord says this, I will make you and the woman hate each other. He's speaking to the devil, the serpent. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. Now, Bible scholars tend to all agree that that is a veiled reference to the Savior that's coming. It literally says not the offspring of the woman, but the seed of the woman. And the woman doesn't have a seed. The woman has an egg. The man has a seed. But God talks about the seed of the woman, speaking of the virgin birth of his son. And here's the thing. There's going to come forth from Eve a Savior. And he, the the serpent, is going to strike him on the heel. And the serpent did that to Jesus on the cross. But Jesus is going to conquer death, hell, and the grave, and he's going to crush the serpent's head. And that's happened. That happened when he rose from the dead. And so in Genesis chapter 3, right after the fall, God promises a Savior. And the Bible is really a story of sin and a story of redemption. And so in Genesis 3, you have sin and you have the promised Redeemer. Well, the devil heard the curse. He heard what God said. He heard Genesis 3.15. There's going to come an offspring of the woman, the seed of the woman. He didn't understand it all. And there's no way. But he knew that, hey, something's going to happen. There's going to be a child from this woman that is going to crush my head. So I need to get after that child. And that's what you have. God gives a promise after the fall, and the devil works after the fall to thwart the promise. He wants to thwart God's promise. Why? Because if he can thwart the promise of God, then God becomes a promise breaker. If God becomes a promise breaker, what do we call people who break promises? Liars. If God becomes a liar, then God becomes a sinner. And if God becomes a sinner, God can't be God anymore. He can't be holy God because now he'd be tainted with sin and God would topple from his throne of holiness and the devil would win and heaven would shut down. See, the devil is at work here. And what do we find in Genesis chapter 4? Right off the bat, he goes after the offspring of Eve. And Cain, the oldest son, kills Abel, the other son because of jealousy, because of anger, because God didn't accept his sacrifice. 
And so what does the devil say? He said, okay, well, the, the, who's ever coming, this offspring of woman, it can't be Cain because Cain is a murderer now, and it can't be Abel because Abel's dead. And so he's working to try and destroy the promise. And then the Bible talks about what goes on in the offspring of Cain. Cain is a picture of an ungodly man, and he has ungodly children. And it gives us a little bit of a picture of what was going on in life at this time. And then we hit chapter 5. Chapter 5 talks about the godly line of Seth, Adam's other son, Seth. And Adam had many sons and daughters, but it pinpoints uh, different ones. And then we hit Genesis chapter 6. And Genesis chapter 6 is a very, very confusing passage of Scripture, very interesting passage of Scripture. I want you to look at it again. Now, it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. What is this talking about? Because then it goes on to talk about the Nephilim and Nephilim, Another word for that is giants. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. There are three main interpretations of that passage, these sons of God. Some say that, well, all the Scripture is talking about here in Genesis chapter 6 is that the godly line of Seth the son of Adam, they got commingled and cohabitated with the ungodly line of Cain and Cain's ungodly daughters mixed with, with Seth's godly line, and they polluted the race that way, and, and everything just went south. That's, that's one interpretation. That's what they say, the sons of God, sons of God, daughters of men. But the Bible, when it uses the term sons of God, it uses it only in the book of Job, three times in the book of Job. Every time it uses the reference, the sons of God, it refers to angelic beings. The sons of God came to appear before the Lord, it says in the book of Job, and Satan also appeared with them. It refers to angels. And God says, hey, Job, where were you when the sons of God were shouting for joy uh, upon creation? Where were you? Uh, It refers to angels. So this is not, I don't believe, talking about the godly line of Seth with the ungodly line of Cain coming together. I think this is talking about angelic beings. And somehow angelic beings began to go after women. Now, there are two schools of thought on angels going after women. One school of thought is that angels, they actually, angels are spirit beings. But you can see an angel. Uh, Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel. She could see him. Zacharias, John the Baptist's dad, he saw the angel when he was uh, in the temple. You you can see angels, but angels are spirit beings. And Jesus said that that spirits don't have flesh and bone. Uh, When he resurrected, he said, touch me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bone like you see I have. So although angels can be visible, they don't have flesh and bone. And so some said, well, if this is saying that somehow angels get together with women, how, how, how does that work? I don't know how that works. But I will say this, the Bible in the New Testament talks about this situation. In the book of 2 Peter and in the book of Jude, The Scripture talks about what happened here in Genesis chapter 6. It talks about how angels left their proper abode, and they stepped out of bounds, and they went after, as Jude says, strange flesh. He he likens it to Sodom and Gomorrah where men went after strange flesh. Men went after gross immorality. Men went after men in Sodom. And he says the same way. Angels went after that which is unnatural, and they went after after women. And some say, well, this is, this is how the devil is working. Somehow demons are coming, and now they're going after women, and they're having children with these women, and they're producing some kind of hybrid race, half demon, half human. Well, if that's the case, and they say that's what the Nephilim are, they're the giants, they're the mighty men, they're half demon, half human. Well, if that is true, Well, one thing is for certain, the Messiah can't come from that race because that's a polluted race. 
Now, I don't think that these are half demon, half human. You know why? Because it says that they're men. Verse 3, then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to him. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. It's not some new breed of cat. It's not some, these are the mighty demon men. There's no such race as demon men. And there's nothing in the Bible that indicates that angels can procreate. Angels are created beings. Boom, they were created. God made a zillion of those angels, but they don't, they don't, they're not like Adam and Eve where they be fruitful and multiply. Angels, they're not fruitful and they don't multiply. So this is what I think the Nephilim were. This is what I think that God is talking about. I think he's talking about angels, demons, fallen angels. The Nephilim, that word means to fall. These are fallen creatures. It's translated giants because they were mighty, but they, they were fallen ones. And I think that angels, men opened their lives up to, to these fallen angels, to these demons, and they were empowered by these demons, and they went after these women who were eyes wide open, knew what this was going on, and they wanted to have some kind of unholy triangle between man, woman, and the devil. And they got together because they, they believed the lie that the devil shared in Genesis chapter 3. You follow me and you will be like God. And so we're going to have these, you're going to have super children because they're going to be the, the product of uh, a man and a woman and a man who is demon possessed coming together with a woman. That makes more sense to me of how that works. But regardless, here's the issue. The devil was trying to pollute the race. Because if he can pollute the race, then the promise can't come. Then Messiah can't come. And so the devil is hard at work. Now, there's an interesting passage in 1 Peter chapter 3. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 3. Because, you know, when it comes to Noah, some people say, well, I don't even think Noah is a real person. Well, Jesus did. He talked about him a lot. Peter did. He talked about him in both his epistles. The writer of Hebrews did. I, it's very obvious that Noah was a real person. And you know what is really interesting? I learned this in seminary years and years ago when I was in seminary. When it comes to the flood story, every ancient society has a flood story. You know why? Because there was a flood. That's why. That's why everybody has a flood story, because it's like, yeah, we all know about the flood, because, you know, you say we all came from Adam and Eve. We did, but we all came from Noah and Mrs. Noah, because he was the only one, and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their three wives, they're the only ones that made it. Everybody else got wiped out. So you can trace your lineage back to, to Noah. But here is what it says in 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Now watch this. In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. What's he talking about, the spirits now in prison? Anytime the Bible refers to spirits, it's not referring to men. It's referring to angelic beings. Demons are part of the angelic realm says, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during which the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. See, people have read that, and they scratch their head, and they say, what is he talking about? This is what I think. I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, would you show me what this is talking about? And I feel like God answered my prayer just this morning and gave me insight that I had never had before. Because I was thinking, why would... Jesus, why would you go and go to the prison after you rose from the dead and make proclamation to those angels who were disobedient during the days of Noah, who went after strange flesh? The Bible says that God took those demons, not all of the demons, but he took those specific ones and he put them in bonds. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. 
Jude chapter 1 speaks of that too, that he put them in bonds. He put them in a special prison. And then he rises from the dead, and then he goes to that prison, and he makes proclamation to those spirits now in prison. And I said, Lord, why would you do that? That doesn't make sense to me. What's up with that? And then it just dawned on me. What was the devil trying to do? He was trying to thwart the promises of God. If I can pollute the race, then the Messiah can't come. And listen, it says in Genesis 6, verse 1, that uh, when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, we don't know how many people lived at that time, but they were being fruitful and they were multiplying. They had that command down. They were doing that. And people lived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, you read in Genesis chapter 5. Uh, You know, so-and-so was 187, and he had a son. Can you imagine being 187? It's a boy. I mean, you're 187. But they lived so long. Adam lived to be 930. All those other guys, they lived. You read about them, and they, they lived to be 905. They were 910. They were 777. So people live for hundreds and hundreds of years. They're being fruitful, and they're multiplying One man said there were at least 7 billion people on the earth during the time of Noah. 7 billion. Makes sense. I mean, we live. Would anyone want to live to be 930? No, I mean, how would you get that many candles on your cake? I mean, it would just be something else. But I don't think very many. But but I kind of look at it. You take all those numbers and you divide them by 10. So I think when a man was 187, that was kind of like him being 18, almost 20, in terms of how his physical body was. I mean, you didn't really start getting up in years till you were about 850. You know, it's like, you're really dragging. You're, well, I'm 850, give me a break. But I just think it was kind of like that because life was different before the flood. But here's the thing. Okay, the flood comes. Only eight people are saved out of the seven billion people. Only eight. The devil thinks that he has the Lord right where he wants him. He is polluting the whole race But God always has a remnant, and God saved Noah, and from Noah, the Savior came. And I think when Jesus came up out of the grave, he went to those spirits now in prison, those angels who left their proper abode and mixed with those men and mixed with those women to try and pollute the race, and he said, in your face, Jack. You thought you could thwart the promises of God? You cannot thwart the promises of God. Now, that might not be correct, and... I thought it was pretty cool. And it's a little bit of Uncle Si in there. I just think it's a neat thing. In your face, Jack. I digress. Let's go on to uh, point two. First discovery is the devil is hard at work. Second discovery is man goes from innocence to the depths of depravity. From innocence to the depths of depravity. That's how God created man. He was totally innocent in the garden. He wasn't declared righteous. It's different to be righteous, declared righteous by God, versus being innocent. Adam never sinned, so he was innocent. But the righteousness of God had not been imputed to him. That happens to a Christian who receives Christ. A Christian who receives Christ is justified before God, just as if you've never sinned. Well, Adam had never sinned, but he was capable of falling. He was capable of losing his relationship with God, and that's what happened to him. And he goes from innocence to his eyes being opened to falling so far. You know how many years it was from the time of the creation of Adam until the flood? Sometimes we think, you know, because we're influenced by evolutionary thoughts, so we think, well, it had to be uh, probably, I don't know, billions of years or something like that. When you take the geological record in the Old Testament, you will find this, 1,656 years from the creation of Adam until the flood, 1,656 years. Now, God said in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, that his spirit would not always strive with man, yet his days shall be 120 years. 
So when you back out 120 years, when we read these things in Genesis chapter 6, that's year 1536. It's been a little over 1,500 years, and the world has gotten so wicked in that period of time. And what makes it even more startling is there are two guys who lived, overlapped their life in that 1,536-year period, in that 1,656-year period, two guys. Adam lived to be 930. Methuselah, he lived to be... 969. Those two guys were contemporaries. I mean, when, when, uh, Adam, when Methuselah was born, I wrote this down. I thought it was kind of cool. Adam was 687 when Methuselah was born. Methuselah is Noah's granddad. And, and Noah's dad is Lamech. Adam was 874 when Noah's dad was born, Lamech. I mean, those people knew Adam. They could, you could go talk to Adam. You want to know what it, hey, Adam, I mean, I wonder what it was like back in the day. Well, just talk to Adam. He was there. He's the first guy. You could go talk to him. And Methuselah, he lived, boom, until the day of the flood. Methuselah was the son of Enoch. Enoch was the man who never died. He walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Interesting thing about Methuselah, his name. His name, I mean, have you ever heard a name, Methuselah? It's like, uh, let me, let me, what's a baby, good baby name? Well, Jack, Jim, Methuselah. I mean, you wouldn't come up with that one. That's a bad name, right? His name is significant. His name means it shall be sent when he is dead. What shall be sent? The flood? Destruction of man? It shall be sent when he is dead, and he lived to be 969 years old. He was the oldest man who ever lived. Little joke about Methuselah says the oldest man who ever lived who died before his father did was Methuselah. He died before his father because Enoch never died. Enoch went straight to heaven, didn't taste death. But here you have these two guys, and so you can know what's going on if you lived in the world at that time because the eyewitnesses were there. And the world in that 1,656 years, or if you back out the 120, then it's just the 1,536 years is so wicked. There's a population explosion, and there's all this wickedness going on with demons, and the people are welcoming in the demons into their lives and into their unions. And it says in verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God saw it. Now, he knew it, but now the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good, but then the Lord really focuses in and says, this is what the world is. It is wicked to the core. The wickedness of man is off the chain. And God saw that. And there is no redeeming man. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Let that sink in. That's what God saw. It says in the God's Word translation, all day long their deepest thoughts were nothing but evil. And that's what God saw. What do you do with that? There's no raw material to work with in that kind of a heart. And that's what God saw. Wickedness off the chain. And the world is characterized by two things during the days of Noah. Vice and violence. Vice and violence. Say, what is vice? Vice is immorality. And sexual immorality was rampant during the days of Noah. And people are sinning right and left, and they're not thinking a thing about it. They don't care what God says. They don't care uh, what God had orchestrated, what God had designed. Scripture says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall this coming of the Son of Man be. It says, Jesus also said, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, what do we recognize about Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah had given themselves over to sexual immorality, namely homosexuality. And that was rampant in Sodom and Gomorrah. And there are two instances in the Bible where God brings total devastation, where he blots 
people off the face of the earth in the days of Noah and in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Pinpointed in Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plains. Actually, there were four cities there. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim. All the cities by the Dead Sea. He rained fire and brimstone. They're, just, they're gone. You didn't see, there are no remnants of that. That's just gone. And the Lord did the same thing when he rained water upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And the water rose above the mountains until everything was dead. There was vice. There was violence. It says in Genesis 6, verse 11, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. I read today about two teenagers in Houston. This, was, this happened earlier this year. They were uh, involved in satanic worship. One was 17, one was 16. They lured a 15-year-old girl away from her home, and they got her, and they sexually abused her. They, were, they, they felt like the devil told them to do this so that they could uh, complete their selling of their soul to the devil. And they lured this young 15-year-old girl away, and they sexually abused her, and they stabbed her with a screwdriver repeatedly. She had holes in her face where the screwdriver went in, and they carved in her stomach an upside-down cross. I mean, such, such a horrific crime is unthinkable. That's by a 17-year-old and a 16-year-old. Wow. In Noah's day, the earth was filled with violence. Everywhere you looked, there was violence. And it was a place that was irredeemable. So man goes from innocence to the depths of depravity, and then discovery number three, God is brokenhearted and has no choice but to judge. It says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6, and the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. You know what it means when it says that God was sorry? That word sorry means to sigh. It means to breathe strongly. God, first it says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, that God said... My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is but flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. God said, and then it says in verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man was great. And then it tells us what God felt as he looked out. He was sorry. He breathed a sigh. He looked out upon wicked man, and he went. <sighs> he breathed strongly. He was grieved in his heart. He had pain in his heart. And God is speaking in anthropomorphic language like, like he's a man and, and like he's a man looking out at, at the, the, his creation and he's just, ah, ah. It's just so heavy in his heart that he sees all this stuff that in Genesis chapter 1 was very good. Now it is disastrous and the earth is filled with wickedness off the chain and it's filled with violence and God is grieved over sin. Now, it's important to note that not all sin is created equal. Sometimes we like to say, well, you know, sin is sin, no matter what it is. I mean, if I'm at the grocery store and I steal a, a two-cent piece of gum, that's sin, just like if I uh, robbed a bank and stole $2 million. It's all the same in the sight of God. Sin is sin. Uh, kind of, but not really. God is going to send a flood and wipe everybody out. Why? Because somebody charged a little too much on a herd of goats? No. There's, there's some deep sin here. The wickedness of man was great on the earth. Hey, any sin will keep you from the Savior, but there's a sin that brings consequences. You know, if I, if I go out on Moore's Lane and I get caught going uh, 60 in a, in a 45, why well, get a ticket? But I'm not going to go to the pen for that for 10 years, hopefully. I might have to pay a $100 fine. Hey, there, there's some laws you break that have these consequences and some others that have these consequences. You start breaking big laws as they were doing, and you bring upon yourself the judgment of God. 
Now, God is grieved over sin. It hurts him. Now, I want you to think about this. If God is grieved when he looks out on the masses who did not know him, and he's grieved in his heart, it pains him in his heart to see them living sinful lives, how much more when he sees his own children, those who claim the name of Christ, and you're living a sinful life. God is grieved. He's hurt. It pains him in his heart. Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit who's given to you, who's your pledge of redemption. Don't grieve him. Don't pain him. That hurts God. He's grieved over sin, and he's grieved when he's forced to judge. God has no choice but to judge this ancient world. Why? Does he have no choice? Because the world is irredeemable. He can't bring it back. They're not listening to him. Noah is called a preacher of righteousness. He preached for 120 years while he was building the boat. How many converts did he have? How many people did he have come forward when they sang for 120 years, just as I am? None, except his own family. Nobody listened to him except his own family. The ark's a big boat. There's room in the ark for people, but they didn't come. They didn't come. It's irredeemable. And so God has no choice but to bring judgment. Listen, the devil would want you to believe that God gets some kind of sadistic joy out of judging people. That God, long, he's just clapping his hands, rubbing his hands together and said, oh boy, now I get to whack them. Not God. He's grieved in his heart. He is sighing. And he said, there's nothing left to do. There's nothing left except judgment. Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 32, the Scripture says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. And there are three people, three classes of people in this room, three classes of people watching on television, listening on radio, on live streaming, three classes. You tell me which class you're in. Number one, there's the class, the lost person. person that doesn't know Christ. Maybe you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you know about him in your head, but you've never entrusted your whole life to him. And you're here, and the Lord is calling you. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, the Lord says, therefore repent. Turn from your wicked ways. Come to me and live. And God is calling to you to come. You're a lost person. The Lord loves you, and he wants to save you. Second class of people here today. You're a saved person, but you're a saved person who's grieving God because you're not walking with God. You're not pleasing God. You're not obeying God. You know you're not. You're living in sexual immorality. See, that's one of the the marks of the, the, the days of Noah. You just don't care what God thinks about it. Let the marriage bed be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. And you say, well, who cares? Yeah, I'm living with my boyfriend. I'm living with my girlfriend. Yeah, we're not married, but who cares? It matters to God. It matters to God. And if you're living like that, you're grieving his heart if you know him. You're never going to grow in your relationship with him because you're not obeying him. And some of you are here like that. Whatever your your sin might be, you're just giving over this little area of your heart. You have this pocket of rebellion, this pocket of sin. You're holding it in there, and you think, well, I can still walk with God. You can't. You're going to grieve him, and he's going to sigh over you. doesn't mean you're going to die and go to hell. If you really belong to him, you won't. But do you really want to live your life? Like that? Is that what you want to give to the Savior when you die and you stand before God and you say, well, God, I just blew you off my whole time as a Christian. But now, little children, the Bible says, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back in shame at his coming. You don't want to be be like that. There's a third group, third class. That's the person, not perfect, not doing everything right, but a desire in his heart, a desire in her heart to please God. 
And you're not grieving him, you're pleasing him. You're dealing with sin in your life, you're getting it out, and you're walking with him, you're spending time with him, you're saying, here I am, Lord, fill me, use me. I want to be the person you want me to be. God takes great pleasure in a person like that. I want to close with this question. When you look soberly within, is God pleased with you, or is he grieved over you? We've been talking about the days of Noah, days that brought about a worldwide flood and destroyed the earth. Listen, God had a way of salvation for the people of Noah's day. It was an ark. And God has a way of salvation for you and me today. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that ark of Noah's day, it pictured the Lord Jesus. And you were either in or out. So where are you today? When it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, have you made a decision to surrender your life to Him? Or are you on the fence? Are you still thinking about it? Listen, I don't know when judgment is coming, but I know it's coming. The day of the Lord will come, the Bible says, and you need to be ready. So I wanna encourage you and invite you to pray this simple prayer with me and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and King. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you're God in the flesh. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose again from the dead on the third day. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord, be my Savior. I surrender my all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray a prayer like that and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Pastor Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real life.